Great. Okay, fantastic. Um, so first of all, very nice to meet you all. Uh, my name's Jack. Uh, I'm with uh, Oblivious, so one of the, the platforms that's supporting the, the Datathon. Um, and I've seen a number of um, names come up uh, in the participant list who I think uh, I, I know quite well through the various work we've been doing with the UN previously. Uh, more to join. So um, in this kind of office hours, I'm hoping to keep it fairly um, intuitive. Often when we think of privacy and analytics technologies and specifically output privacy data disclosure controls like differential privacy, people dive straight into the kind of hardcore maths and proofs. And that's not the most useful thing always. So sometimes, um, you know, just like if you were learning statistics or if you were learning machine learning or something, uh, maybe more appealing way to get started with something um, is to kind of get an intuitive sense of what's going on and then to be able to use that intuitive sense of what's going on to actually build applications or discover you know, insights from data as opposed to proving a new algorithm is correct. So um, a lot of the kind of training and tutorials around especially differential privacy, which I'll describe uh, in more detail uh, shortly, is really around formal proofs, but hopefully this is just going to be more strong intuition so that you can actually use it <laughs> throughout the competition. Um, with that in mind, I can kick off and share my screen and, and go through just a few slides and then basically just a walkthrough. So at a very high level, I'm going to try to give you an overview of what differential privacy is, how it's useful in machine learning and statistics whenever you're working with sensitive data sources, and you want to share some insights um, externally, or you don't want the data scientist to directly see the raw underlying data. Um, and then once we kind of have a good sense of what's going on, well, you need to actually interact with something. So I'll take you over to kind of a, an overview of how the data uh, will be held up uh, within the, the confidential computing environments, et cetera, how you connect in and how you would you know, maybe use some things like taking averages or training a machine learning model, et cetera, on a sensitive data source and using the the, the AG tools that basically. Um, yeah, great. I'll kick it off. Great. Okay. So as I said, we'll cover the fundamentals of differential privacy for machine learning and statistics from a very intuitive sense. I, I you know, yeah, I, I think going deep into the formal proofs is, is not the right thing to do uh, as we go. So uh, this is obviously one of the office hours. There's a, a chain of these. So hopefully we've already got an introduction to responsible data science and kind of hands-on privacy tech, and also uh, an overview of machine learning models uh, kind of setting up the data science pipelines, et cetera, et cetera, by my colleague Ali, who's been kind enough to host this call for us. Uh, and today's session is then on the kind of fundamentals of differential, differential privacy and machine learning uh, for machine learning and statistics. And this is kind of what you would actually be doing through the, the datathon. So you can follow along. There's nothing here that's confidential. You can play around with it even before the datathon just to you know, have some experience. There's even a, a live competition ongoing with Harvard that you can feel free to take part in just to kind of get the nuts and bolts uh, ahead of the datathon itself. Um, but yeah, we'll start there. Now, there is a slider <laughs> and there is a QR code um, for people to uh, kind of get an understanding of people's kind of current strengths and weaknesses and skill set, et cetera. And I believe you could use the QR code for that. So that's on screen now. Um, uh, yeah, right. so I think maybe for this session, we might ignore this because this was for Q&A posting, um, okay. but it, maybe it, it might be simpler for people to just post questions in the chat for, for managing Q&A this time. Excellent. Ali, you don't mind monitoring them and then just calling them out because I can't actually see them if my screen should. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Perfect. Great. Okay, so what's the agenda, right? <laughs> so in this part of the, the data thought, on this platform, you're gonna be working with actual sensitive data. So 
real data from a, a UN organization, which is sensitive, and which you're not going to directly get to access. That data is held in something called a, a confidential computing environment or a trusted execution environment, and it restricts what you can do to only allow you to perform differentially private operations. Thus, you can't extract the raw record level information, but you can extract the kind of macro information, the trends, et cetera. And that's really the whole purpose of this. Last year, um, the, the data provider was the, um, the UN uh, Refugee uh, Commission. Uh, I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> UNHCR, thank you, um, who provided information about refugees and the effects of COVID and whether or not they had to sell assets or not. So if you imagine just reflecting on last year, that type of problem, but what they're really trying to do, and in fact, their entire micro data library is trying to provide is to share information with academics, with different governments, et cetera, to help protected people, people in need. But at the same time, those people tend to be you know, refugees for a reason. So it's of the utmost importance that you protect their identity and you don't allow any malicious party to try to reverse engineer or identify any individual within that sensitive group. So you want to be able to share the macros, the trends, the big picture views so that people can take actionable insights from them, but you do not want to overstep on privacy as it could lead to kind of devastating outcomes. Now, in other cases, such as trade, et cetera, the risks might be more economical risks as opposed to, you know, kind of harm of protected groups, et cetera. But nevertheless, the whole idea here is to uh, see the big picture, but not the granular information, i.e. anti-granular. So we'll cover what is differential privacy. We'll see some actual uh, using Python, basically, in Jupyter Notebooks, which you can follow along or you can play this back, et cetera. Um, and you'll actually kind of get your hands dirty if you would like to. So to set the scene, I wanted to give the context so uh, of why any of this is even important. And for a long time, people have been releasing information about other people, about patients, about civilians, about financial transactions, etc. Uh, the Census Bureaus have been around for a very long time, over 100 years in many cases. And that information is you know, incredibly important to um, share with governments so that they know how many schools they need to build, how many hospitals they need to build, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as technology improves and as kind of the skill set but mathematical, statistical skill sets, et cetera, improve um, of a widening, wider, wider group, we have to be very careful about what information goes into the public sphere. And from that information, what could potentially be that information be used for? One of the most famous case studies that you'll come across if you look up the topic uh, is the, the story of the Massachusetts health, da health data. So in the US, there's a state called Massachusetts. Um, and the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission anonymized um, a large number of um, patient health records um, in Massachusetts back in the 90s. And they were sharing this information with research groups um, you know, and with goodwill. You know, they, they, were, they were doing this to hopefully, um, you know, better support the, the healthcare mechanisms uh, for the general public. However, at the time, there was a student at MIT who is now a very famous uh, Harvard professor called Latania Sweeney, who thought there was something wrong with this. And what was being done is what's being done in many organizations, and it's the stripping of PII, right? So what was deemed to be PII, personally identifiable information, was essentially people's names, phone numbers, maybe their their um, can't even say their address in this case, but you know the, the kind of obvious um, first kind of pass of what might be sensitive that would allow you to re-identify an individual. And once they stripped this information, they said the data had been anonymized and thus was safe to share. And Latania had a bit of a gut feeling that something was up with this. So she thought, well, okay, I don't have people's names necessarily, but could I work them out? Or could I connect that data source with another data source and reconstruct individuals from that data set. So what she did was um, Cambridge, so it's, it's an area of, of Northern Boston, and um, you could buy the voter registration 
data set. So she bought the voter registration data set. And on that, it had people's um, age, their address, and their gender. It was these three pieces of information. And what she did was she tried to individually, one by one, go through and say, okay, well, if I know these three things, um, could I find where they might be in the patient records data set? And one by one, there was a match, and there was another match, and there was another match. And she found that you could actually match 87% of the of all of the patients basically uh, in the data set. So you could get, you know, 87, re-identifying 87% of individuals is a very, very high number. Um, and at the time there was a governor called Weld who had previously said, listen, this data is private, it's safe, we can share it and it's, you know, for, for the good of the people, et cetera. And not only did she show that 87% of the individuals in that data set could be re-identified, she also found Governor Wells' uh, patient history, along with the procedures that he had had and his medications, et cetera. Uh, and obviously that was quite a striking um, realization that, hang on a second, maybe just removing people's names, et cetera, is not enough to hide their information. Now, you, you think that there would be a, an obvious learning from this and everyone would take a U-turn in how they share their information and make sure that the things go through correct data disclosure controls. And often there's also an inkling to think that, you know, kind of big tech would be the leaders in this. And in many cases they are, in many cases there's been accents too. And this isn't to point a finger at any group. I feel like this is just a really compelling uh, story and use case that hopefully gets you thinking about um, why uh, privacy enhancing technologies, and in this case, differential privacy is, is so valuable and important. And then, also why to you know try it out learn more and maybe put some effort into uh this platform within the the data thought so in 2006 for any of you uh in the audience <laughs> uh virtual audience who enjoy data science you may very well of once upon a time signed up for Kaggle so Kaggle is a competition like a basically a machine learning data science competition platform and um, it's very large, it's now owned by Google. And what they did was they allowed companies to host very big competitions. Um, in the case of the Netflix prize, it was a million dollar competition and they could set a challenge for people. And then data scientists around the world, machine learning engineers could then compete to try to win in this, to show their models were the best, et cetera, with the highest predictive accuracy or performance in some under some performance metric. Um, and ultimately, the people who were top of the ladder at the end of the competition won serious money. And as, as, as I said, and in the Netflix prize, it was a million dollars. So it's quite a compelling reason to, you know, roll up your sleeve and, and do some machine learning and data science. So in the Netflix prize, essentially what you were asked to do was you looked at individuals viewing patterns. So what TV shows and movies did they watch? And you had to predict what they were likely to watch next. From Netflix, you know, um, I think Netflix famously said their largest competition was sleep. So people would either go to sleep or watch another series. So um, so they were always trying to recommend things that would keep people engaged on their platform. So recommending better movies and TV shows, et cetera, to the users of the platform necessarily meant higher engagement, higher retention, stronger business model. So they were happy to fork up the million dollars. Um, from the data scientists' perspectives, it was a great, it was real data from a real large growing tech platform. Um, and it's just interesting, right? Like you want to say, oh, I wonder who, I don't know, <laughs> nowadays who's interested in the Barbie movie or whatever. Um, so like what proportion of people or, you know, people who like this also like, you know, what else, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a quite an interesting competition. However, people, you know, researchers kind of said, well, this feels like a lot of personal information. Um, and so a number of them, what they did was they actually looked at another platform, nothing to do with Netflix, and it's the IMDB platform. So IMDB, basically another website where people just review stuff, <laughs> review movies, basically. And they say, oh, this was you know, five star. I thought it was the best movie ever or, or whatnot. But there was a little trick in here. So whenever people watch something on Netflix, 
some small portion or some small subset of them would tend to write a review pretty much straight after they watched it. So if you looked at the timestamps of when people were like watching the, the movies, et cetera, and then commenting or liking, et cetera, not for everyone, but for a small group, you could once again re-identify who they were. And the challenge here is that by doing so, you um, you could identify things around personal preferences, both political, um, but I believe there was a lawsuit because um, it revealed one person's kind of um, kind of sexual orientation, which was a, a sensitive variable, which obviously was not consented to being shared when they signed up for their Netflix account. Um, and I believe the case closed with an undisclosed amount payment to that person. Uh, but again, you know, I know we're saying 2006, Netflix prize went on quite long, and it actually also set the kind of beginnings of many other competitions that, that, that ran in a similar way. And so these stories act as kind of warnings to us of like, how can we actually work with sensitive data, typically the most important and relevant data in the world that has the most impact to individuals, to patients, to kind of changing the good of humanity while not directly seeing the data. Now, in parallel to this, four now extremely famous um, researchers came up with this new con concept. They said, how can you let people learn about groups, but not learn about individuals? They, they're kind of, phrasing of this or framing of it was that record and entity level information is what's sensitive. So for example, my name is Jack. I have some credit card. I make payments. So is the sensitive thing that my name is Jack or is the sensitive thing the credit card payments which I make? So if you know the locations of three times I've ever used my credit card, you can bring it back exactly to me. If you know the time and location, you can re-identify me uh, you know, within, say, Visa or MasterCard, et cetera. Um, so the information is what describes the person. It's not just the name. You know, it's it's the whole piece of information. And I say record or entity level. The reason I say that is because in a single uh, database, maybe I have many, many transactions that are on my credit card. And I don't know, maybe I have very few. But nevertheless, all of those are about me. Right. So there could be many rows that are still about the same entity, the same person or business or organization, et cetera. Or there might be just one record or one to one method. Either way, that information is what's actually the sensitive thing, not just the name or someone's age or where they happen to live. So Cynthia Dwork, uh, Frank McSherry, Kelby Nissim, and Adam Smith introduced this concept called differential privacy. The general idea is not to ever let people see record level information, but rather only aggregates, right? And I say, let's make some noise here. Because even just giving people aggregates doesn't actually prevent them from reverse engineering any individual. So for example, imagine I gave you the average age of 10 people, then I gave you the average age of 11 people. You don't necessarily have to be a rocket scientist to work out the age of the new person who joined the group. So the approach in differential privacy is if the algorithm is randomized, typically, i.e. adding noise to the aggregate, and if the noise is large enough that it basically masks the effect of any individual or entity you know, from that data set, their contribution towards that aggregate, then that's a way where you can kind of hide individuals because the noise is very large compared to the contribution of any individual, and yet the noise is very small, hopefully, when looking at any reasonably large group. So that's essentially how it works. So if you think of a mean, if you think of a sum, if you think of standard deviations or kurtosis or any of these things, you can actually build them up by taking different aggregates like sums, et cetera, over a set of individuals or records or rows, and then essentially adding a little bit of noise such that hopefully that little bit of noise you know, only gives you a very small amount of error, but prevents you from reverse engineering to learn about any one person in that data set. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of an art and science to this. I think Ali showed you these pictures the other day, and it's just the blurring of an image. The more noise there is, the more privacy there is. However, the more noise there is, sometimes the less useful the information is. So you're trying to actually balance these two things so that you basically add the right amount of noise 
in order to get meaningful information out, while also having sufficient noise to prevent the reverse engineering of any individual and thus guaranteeing the privacy of the group. We use the term epsilon to describe how much information has been leaked through this process, and I'll describe what that is next. So, uh, in the last one, I said it's a little bit like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Um, you know, too much noise, not enough noise, just right in between. And so, let's imagine we have a data set with Goldilocks in it. And if we know all about Goldilocks, we want to say, can I tell whether or not Goldilocks is in this data set based on some statistics or machine learning model or something of that nature? Um, we could try to enforce that the probability that she is in the data set, given all of the outputs that we observe, um, is equal to the probability that she is not in the data set, given all of the outputs which we observe, assuming that a noise was you know, kind of applied in both scenarios. If these two probabilities were equal, we have learned absolutely nothing about the data set, and we only have random useful, useless information. Equally, if we were to switch it around and say the probability that she's in the data set is much, 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 much greater than the probability she's not in the data set, given all of the information that we've observed. Well, with very high certainty, we would know that Goldilocks was there or not. And thus, we haven't really protected any privacy. So the actual underlying equation, I've tried to avoid writing a single equation in any of these slides, um, but the actual equation is literally just a formalized version of what I've put here. So the probability that Goldilocks is in the data set, given everything that we've seen, all the statistics we've gotten back, any machine learning model we've trained, et cetera, given all of that information, probability that she is in the data set is gonna be less than or equal to e to the epsilon, the probability that she is not in the data set. And so this kind of acts as a sliding scale. When epsilon is zero, you basically have that equal sign, you've learned nothing, nothing useful in there. When epsilon goes to infinity, you know for a fact that Goldilocks was in the data set or was not in the data set, you have no privacy. And so, you know, typically speaking, you want to keep epsilon maybe less than 10 or less than five. The US Census Bureau got a little bit of kickback um, in 2020 when they used differential privacy for the first time in the US Census. Um, and in total, I believe they used an epsilon of 19.61. Um, in the competition, I believe we're trying to keep everyone below 10, but you can chop it up over as many questions or machine learning um, operations as you like, but just your total epsilon spend. So if you added up all of the epsilon that you spend through all the operations, it just needs to be less than 10, essentially, um, or else you run out. Um, there is another concept around delta and epsilon delta differential privacy. I'm skipping over that because it's not necessary for the data thon. And really, we want to kind of encourage creativity and kind of hands-on, you know, trying things out. Um, really like how you actually you know, use this data for good and to support maybe the 20, 30 UN uh, goals, et cetera, over some um, you know, pure mathematical nuances. Cool. So at this stage, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop over to the anti-granular platform, which is where the data sets will be hosted during the, the datathon. And I'll just show you basically how you connect into something how you connect to a data set, how you apply uh, kind of Python to maybe learn some statistics about a data set, maybe train a machine learning mo model, um, and do something with the data set. Obviously, you can play around with the data set whatever way you want. We encourage creativity, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a quick start so that you can win. OK. If I could only. Uh, uh, now, how do I, for some reason, the Slack controls are overriding. I'm going to just stop sharing for a second and then reshare once I get out of this. Right, stop. Right. So this is the Antigranular platform. It's basically just a tool to host competitions and, 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 and try eyes off data science. All of the underlying differential privacy tools are actually built by Harvard, Microsoft, IBM, et cetera. We just put the glue together so it can run inside of a confidential computing environment. 
and it makes it easy for people to use them to compete in competitions and create notebooks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the competition section, we already have some competitions that are live and notably the Harvard Open DP competition. If anyone wants to play around with that in the interim, they're more than welcome to. Um, the datathon will be coming soon, obviously starting next week, I believe. Um, but when you click into any of these, what you'll get is basically the objective of the challenge. Uh, there's no hard scoring. In this case, it's, it's uh, qualitative and quantitative. It's a trade off of, of both. So there won't be a live leaderboard, but all the basically the information about the competition will be in the wiki and also um, over here also. And then you'll have information about the data set. So you'll see the different column names, the description, different categories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, any specific rules associated with the competition, uh, quick start guide, et cetera. And if you want to, um, if you want to, you know, actually start to use it, it's very, very simple. All you would have to do is just, um, you have to log in. I'm already logged in here, but you literally hit copy. And you can go to any Jupyter notebook. Um, so I just need to move the zoom controls. Um, you can just create a Google Colab. Uh, notebook. No, as I said. New notebook, new notebook. Uh, you don't have to use Google Colab. You can use any Jupyter notebooks you want. Um, I'm using this because then I don't have to host anything on my computer. Uh, it's free, but equally there's lots of different options online. Um, I just copied the cell here. So all that I have to do now is do exclamation mark pip install anti granular run that installs the package. Once it creates a, a session first, I'll just continue as if it's already run. And then I had copied the cell and it says star, 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 star. Uh, and that's because you're just so nobody peeks over your shoulder and sees your credentials. But essentially you just paste and it pastes in your sensitive, your, your private um, key and secret. Don't worry, if you copy it down, I can change it um, before you get a chance to use it. <laughs> um, and once you run this, then you've basically connected your Jupyter notebook to the confidential computing. Um, and any time we use the cells that start with percentage sign, percentage sign AG, so percentage sign, percentage sign AG, the code that runs underneath this, um, everything below runs in the confidential environment. So I'll show you a few examples of this, but that's literally it. That's all you have to do to get started. Open any Jupyter notebook. Uh, if you're running one locally on your machine, you have any issues, just let us know uh, in, in the chats, etc. You do exclamation mark, pip install anti-granular. You paste in the cell um, that was already there. The competition name will obviously be different. <coughs> I would say only registrants of the competition will be able to see and have access to the UN Datathon. So that's one of the restrictions we put in place. But um, I'm assuming everyone on this call are <laughs> people who have already registered. Um, and then any cell that you do AG, that code is going to run inside of the confidential compute where the sensitive data lives. And the operations you can apply are just essentially a restricted form of Python that guarantees that um, the sensitive data has gone through a differential privacy function to make it safe before you can download it onto your computer. Um, a great place to get started with this is actually in the notebook section. So um, there's lots of notebooks already here. So um, mastering privacy first record linkage. So this would be if you had two data sets and you wanted to connect them together. Uh, DP hypothesis testing. So if we were to go into here, this is an example. It's a full walkthrough of saying, okay, I have some sensitive information. I like, let's say it's a, a big data frame and there's dates in there and the dates are sensitive, but I don't know the format of the dates. Are they written in the American style, in the European style? 
are they all numbers? Do they use dashes? Maybe they use letters for the month. You know, there's so many different ways that you can just even write a date. And so you might want to learn about the structure of that data to like figure out the different formats without ever seeing it. So in this case, uh, I'll show you the AG cells. So we have a private data frame called uh, private data frame. Um, and all we're going to do is basically import uh, pandas. And then we're going to check um, if the format is day, day, month, month, year, 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 year format, if that makes sense. Um, and so you just basically write a little function that returns zeros if the uh, the date does not match that format and ones if it does match that format. So you've created, an, you've taken a private data frame and then you've applied an operation through apply map that goes row by row and is just taking uh, a, a row level information and applying a function to it to another row level information that's also private, but you've just transformed it. So this is still a private data frame. Um, but when, because it's a data frame, it has most of the um, built in data frame operations, including mean. So it's like an average. And you can just say how much epsilon you want to spend on that. So tell me of the ones and zeros now of whether or not the date match that format or not. But how many, what's the average that match the format? But only spend epsilon equals to 0 0.05 on it. Um, I actually generated fake dates here. Uh, this is a, a simulation just to kind of give you an idea. And exactly one in four match that format. Uh, not exactly because it's randomly sampled, but strongly approximately was one in four. And what you'll find is almost 25% exactly comes out. In fact, if we were to uh, run it on the real data, you get, I think it's, yeah, it's 0. 0.01% off, right? So you have actually really, really accurate results. Um, but because the data set is large and you've applied, in this case, 0.05% uh, epsilon, you haven't actually disturbed your accuracy very much. You've added an amount of noise, you get a very valuable statistic, but you haven't spent much budget, right? And that's the whole kind of balancing accuracy with, um, with epsilon spent. That's the, the art and science of eyes off data science. Now, of course, there's many operations here. I'll, I can go through um, many more of them, but again, I'm just applying more functions, trying out different dates, combining them. All of these notebooks um, are available on the platform. So you can kind of, it's a good place to like start from. You know, there's a new data set. You're not too sure about some information about it. Check it, the notebooks. Maybe even play around with a different data set that's not sensitive, so it doesn't cost you any of your Epsilon budget. Get something that kind of works and then apply it within the competition. And so we'll only track the Epsilon that you spent on the UN data, uh, uh, data set. So it just means you can try things out without spending your budget too early. Um, as I said, there's a range of different uh, libraries and operations which you can apply. Um, over the next few sessions, you'll actually go into the weeds on many of these. Um, and so you can see how you can apply machine learning operations uh, specifically within Diffrib Lib. You'll see how you can apply pandas operations. Um, you don't have every pandas operation, but you have the vast majority of them that you would use for regular statistics, um, et cetera, et cetera. And even before that, or as a, a nice little kind of cheat sheet, um, as you're um, working within the datathon, there's a doc section. And if we open this, a new tab, yeah, you get an overview of private Python. And within the overview, what you'll find is there's pandas, there's different lib. So anyone who's familiar with scikit-learn, uh, which is a very popular open source machine learning framework, different lib is the differentially private variant. Again, doesn't have every function, but you have your random forests and your decision trees, your linear regression, logistic regression, your um, k-means clustering, your PCA, principal component analysis. A lot of the common operations that are used. Um, so you can use diff lib. If you want to use um, SQL, 
uh, queries on the sensitive data frames. We also have them. So smart noise made by sorry, different labels made by IBM Research. Uh, smart noise SQL and smart noise synth are are built um, in Microsoft. OpenDP is from Harvard. Uh, smart noise SQL allows you to ask uh, SQL queries. Smart noise synth allows you to create fake data, synthetic data that's differentially private. So this fake data that's been generated uh, can't be sorry, excuse me can't be used to reverse engineer any of the original inputs. OpenDP is a lower level, so it's a very flexible framework, but it's kind of in the weeds. So for beginners, it might be a little bit challenging, but I definitely encourage people to, to try it out. It's one of the most secure differential privacy frameworks that are kind of out there. So, um, sorry. I should have brought water if I was talking for now. Um, so it, it's, they're basically trying to build almost like the open SSL, so the very flexible nuts and bolts that will support um, the building of many new differential privacy libraries on top. SP link and record linkage also allow you to join data sets together without ever directly seeing that data. So really, this is your, your cheat sheets along with the notebooks where you can kind of copy and paste um, cells from like just to get started so you can learn about like apply map etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and if you want to open up any of these what you'll find is at the top you can hit launch notebook when you hit launch notebook you can launch it on google collabs on github or you can download the jupyter notebook i've already opened some of them um, just here in google collab so once you've opened it up yourself you just have to paste in your client ID and client secret, which was just in the cells. I'm going to show you how to do that. So if you were on the wine data set, you would just copy this and paste it. And it's just pasted in your details instead of the, the default ones. When you upload a notebook, it also strips out your private key and uh, your, your ID and your private key also. And then you can actually just run the cells yourself modify them, try out different things and, and, and learn from that and then use that learning to uh, work in the data them. Um, other examples, there was the car valuation um, data set as well. That's not a bad place to start if you're interested in doing some kind of machine learning on the underlying data set. Um, you can find it here, Samus created that. So it, it goes through basically the installation process. It's quite a detailed guide, all of these. So they really take you step by step in how to use each of the packages, often with a, a goal in mind, like maybe trying to predict um, the, the value of a car or work with wine data sets or something like that, et cetera. And it's a really good place to basically learn from. Now, and yeah, um, that can be copied in. So you can do the, you can launch the notebook in exactly the same way to follow along. Um, and obviously you can, view all the cells, you just click on them. And they open up for you. Um, and there's also, in these ones, there's a lot of kind of um, playing around with plots, plots which are differentially private. So like, you know, you're plotting information, but this is after the epsilon has been um, has been applied. The two, probably the two most useful functions that you're gonna wanna keep an eye on when you're in here is whenever you've taken sensitive data and You've you know you've basically applied a differentially private mechanism to that sensitive data, and now you've got something that's safe to bring back. You will use the cell, which is export. So I use the the method called export. Uh, I definitely have export. Oh, maybe I haven't used export it. So basically from AG utils, you just import AG print and you can import export. AG print will just print whatever you want to print from the private session back onto your screen, but it will only do it if it's not private information. So if you have a private data set, you can only, it will, it will know that and it won't allow you to actually print it or extract that information 
unless it's gone through a different through private mechanism. Um, the other method is called export. Export works in a very similar way. So I could literally export this instead of printing it. All I would do is I would copy that information and I would say what name I want to give it. So that's called, I'm gonna name it an, a variable name example. So if I was to run this cell and then I was back, now this is no longer an AG cell. So this is running in my current Jupyter notebook. If I was to use the variable example, the result of this has now been exported to the variable name example. And I just use it like any other variable in Python. So I can create plots with it, et cetera, et cetera. That's pretty much the main, main thing. So AG print and export. You can only print and export um, data that's gone through a differential privacy mechanism. The set of differential privacy mechanisms are all defined within docs. And basically uh, you have most of the pandas operations. You just have to specify the epsilon you want to use. And you have all of the methods in different lib, smart noise SQL, smart noise synth, um, and OpenDP. Pretty broad set of operations. Um, and otherwise, you just write Python as is normal. There's a few things you're not allowed to do. Like um, you're not allowed, if you're applying a method row by row um, on sensitive information using apply map, that won't let you take a variable in here and make it a global, for example. So it is, you do write Python code, but if you try to do something that would accidentally reveal some sensitive information, you get an error and it just explains to you like, hey, you're not gonna be able to do this because you'll be leaking private information. Um, of course, like if, if this is coming up, you just message us, we can always walk you through it or maybe how to fix your code and we're, we'll be on the whole way through the data book. Great. So um, with that, I'm going to go back. And one thing I definitely want to emphasize is um, you can just use the operations. You definitely do not need to build your own machine learning or statistics differential privacy operations from scratch. That is like a master's thesis project, not a data fund. But just to give you a little bit of intuition of how it works, if I think at this point we've gotten the idea, let's say I'm taking an aggregate like the sum of something, I'm going to add a little bit of noise or a little bit of error to it automatically through these libraries in order to hide um, you know, the influence of any individual so that you can't reverse engineer the original individuals. But how does this really work in machine learning, for example? These models seem more complicated. And actually, it's the exact same thing. So in machine learning, there's different kind of approaches to, to learning or training, often they're gradient based um, optimization that you're doing. So like all of neural networks use different variants of like dropout and conjugate gradient descents, et cetera. So basically you pass through a big chunk of data, you work out the accuracy, and then you say, if I was to change this weight, how would it affect the accuracy? And you work out the, the gradient, that's, the, that's basically what that's called, um, one by one by one. Um, and then you update your weights. So that summing over to like to work out what the net change in your accuracy would be, that step is an aggregate. And so essentially um, what you do in these, what's happening under the hood in these methods is the gradients get clipped. So they're limited in terms of its uh, magnitude and noise is applied, um, which basically hides the individual contribution of any individual training sample on that gradient step let's say differential privacy, uh, neural networks training and stuff like that works. In other things like random forests, they kind of cheat a little bit. So usually in random forests, you try to find the best split to split your data and you kind of recursively keep splitting the data best based on some genie criteria or some criteria that tells you if it's a good split or not. Uh, in the differential privacy approach, obviously they're quite conscious of spending too much epsilon. So they actually just randomly split up the data set by creating random trees, totally randomly. But then they use a differential privacy average, so a mean operation uh, within each partition to work out what the predictive value would be, for example, in like a um, in a regression tree. Uh, they do an equivalent thing for a classification too. But these are all happening under the hood. So you don't need to know the details of them. I'm just telling you this um, as a bit of fun. Um, yeah, to kind of 
get people interested in privacy enhancing technologies outside of just the data thought itself. There's loads of documentation around. I've put some here. The anti-granular docs um, are a great place to actually just learn the methods. And there's a lot of walkthroughs as well that you can follow, which is a, a good place to start. The Jupyter notebooks in anti-granular, you can just you know, sign up or sign in. And when you're in there, any of the notebooks that are on there, you can just launch the notebook like I showed you, and then modify it in Google Colab or on your local computer, make any changes you want, see how, you know, kind of get the feedback loop learn from doing etc i think that for me that's the best way to learn um there's a quick start youtube video by one of my colleagues Shobat that walks you through how to actually kind of compete in a competition um but kind of at a very like cell by cell level we didn't quite have time to do that in depth today um and there's also there's a really great very well-known youtuber called tubu um who's hundreds of thousands of subscribers and stuff um and she also has a youtube video of how to handle sensitive data uh, using anti granular as well. The underlying frameworks, I mean, it's all possible because of the underlying frameworks, which include OpenDP, Smart Noise, and Diffrivlib, and they all have great documentation too. So if you're saying to yourself, okay, how do I, there's this unknown data set, which is now available to me through anti creditor I'm not really sure what to do with that. Step one, have a look at probably notebooks first is how I would go about it. But have a look at some notebooks just to get some inspiration of what I could do, what methods I could run, what plots I could create. Um, I open up the docs into a separate tab. So I have that open to me as well. And then I would try to personally, how I would start off is I probably have some high level goal that I'm trying to achieve. I probably do some sort of exploratory data analysis that help maybe visualize the data set or maybe think about how I could use the data set and then validate if any of my hypotheses are correct. Or maybe say, how would that data set be useful? Like some macro information about that data set. If I was to combine it maybe with another data set that I found online that's open or something like that. That's that would be a pretty uh, powerful approach towards your your um uh your 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 work in the data fund. And then I just go back to the, the the docs references. So if there's any, if you're like, I'm not sure exactly if this method works or not, hopefully it's listed there. The, you know, the methods, inputs and outputs are, are very clear, so you can just copy and paste that. But even if there's any confusion, we have an army of people who are on the chats to help support. So if you're like, hey, I'm trying to do this, but this functions are not working, there's a bunch of us there to help and support you. Great. So last thing I'm going to say is just that um, tomorrow there'll be a deep dive into pandas specifically. And that will, I mean, that's one of the most useful libraries, I would say. Um, and then there's the, the rest of the agenda over the next uh, week, right up to the competition itself to help make sure everyone is successful through the datathon. All of these sessions are recorded. You can watch them back. All the notebooks are available already, so you can read them anytime. You can play with them anytime. The documentation is already up. The wiki is getting uh, better and better day by day as we get towards um, D-Day, <laughs> the competition for the datathon itself. Um, and if you need any support at any time, reach out to us at, at, at through the discords, et cetera. Um, great. OK, so I'll stop there. If there's any questions, we still have a few minutes. I'm not on a hard stop or anything. So feel free to ask any questions. If I can help you, I would be very happy to do so. And otherwise, thank you for listening. It's hard to listen to someone talk um, for an hour. So <laughs> thank you for your patience. And yeah, happy to answer any questions. Okay, can we import a data set into anti-granular and then use them during modeling? Great question by um, Thabati. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Yes, you can. So if you find an open data set and you want to bring it into the session and try to join them together in some way, you can absolutely do that. Um, I'll actually just show you very quickly how to do that, just so you have it for reference. Uh, yes, okay, that works this time. So in the DP hypothesis testing, notebook. I actually created fake data so that I could um, upload it and 
like so we knew what the fake data was, <laughs> but I uploaded it so it would turn it into a, a private data frame just so that you could play around with it. Um, but that you can literally copy those steps. So let me just show you here. So if you go to the, <laughs> the DP hypothesis testing notebook, if you scroll down, first is the standard um, import install anti-granular, um, import, et cetera, et cetera. But then the first cell, I'm creating fake data. So that's not useful. I mean, that's, you know, you would be maybe loading data from a different data source or something. The second step is we're taking our session. So the session was created when we um, when we logged in. And we're using private import data frame equals DF or whatever your data frame was called. And then you give it a name. And that name is what you're going to refer to that data frame as inside of the enclave itself. Uh, and you can import like data frames and lists and other, other objects that could be useful for you. Uh, you can't import like um, code because we have to be very strict inside of the confidential computing environment that you're only running trusted, safe, limited functionality code so that you can't extract anything that's sensitive. Um, but once you've done session private import, then within the AG cells, the DF is the data frame. In this case, I cast it to a private data frame. If you just want to use it as a data frame itself, you definitely can. And then you can use any of the record linkage to try to combine that open data set with the, the data frame or the private data frame. That's the, the data funds uh, data set. So yes, you absolutely can. Sounds like a great idea if you had some interesting data set to join together. Um, I would definitely suggest that you should do that. <laughs> that would be a, a good, uh, yeah, that would be probably come up with some very interesting results from the hackathon. data thought. Okay, I also see Raj is having an issue with uh, login errors. Okay, I, I won't be, it'll be hard for me to recreate that. Um, but I assume it's to do with your credentials. Um, you um, can sign in. Yes, Raj? Yeah, sorry. I, I was not sure because uh, I went to the Harvard data set, uh, the computation, mm -hmm. and then there was on the right as there was a session info. So I just copied it and just pasted it in Google Collab, but it says uh, it's login credential failed. So I'm, that's why I was kind of asking if I'm missing. So, so the number one, so I, I haven't seen your screen, nor do I know the exact steps. We can totally help you in um, in the Discord, but um, sure. it will be a little yeah, bit unfair exactly. to ask you to share your, to share your screen here. But oh, the yeah, one yeah, thing but... that people do a lot is if you're not signed in, um, it won't have your secret your id and your secret key so you you have to sign in first before when you copy it you bring it over i know a number of people did that i, I did week. sign in with my gmail account um and this is exactly what i see uh what is on your screen right now and this is what mm -hmm. i copy after doing the pip install pantry granule and it says login credential failed so yeah that was Okay, brilliant. If you just share like the either a screenshot or the error message in the Discord, somebody will like resolve sure. it for you, you know, awesome. in, in an Thank hour you. or two. Yeah. No problem. Great. Any other questions while we're here? Also, thanks for for flagging it. If there's any issue, if anyone finds any issues, please do flag them. It's the only way that we're able to um Make sure that it's a smooth experience for everyone during the datathon. And also, if there's any questions that come up and we're like, oh, maybe there's just you know a common misunderstanding or problem, we can then add them to the kind of FAQs. So hopefully it supports other people um through the through the datathon as well. Great. Okay, well, we're exactly on the hour. So if there's no other questions, um, we can wrap up there. The session has been recorded. We're always available. Um, oh, oh, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, um, but, but if there's any questions, please just reach out, let us know. We can create even extra videos, even if they're not scheduled and just post them to help people throughout the datathon. 
our whole purpose here is just to make you hopefully as successful as possible through the uh, through the datathon. So, um, and also if people are just interested in privacy enhancing technologies generally and they want more resources or they're interested in different topics that maybe isn't covered in the competition, we would definitely encourage that. There's lots of groups who are fantastic around the world from open mind to some of the federated learning groups, et cetera, too. And we could, we'll always be happy to try to point people in the right direction. So um, get involved, you know, try to help your, your colleagues out. Um, and will you share email? Sorry, so there was questions that just came in about, will we share emails? I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. Um, obviously we're not sharing emails with, with, with anyone. Um, so when somebody signs in with their Gmail, that's just, for, I mean, they can delete their account anytime, obviously. Um, everyone who's signed up for the Datathon, we just automatically create an account for them and they have access to the um, UN Datathons competition, but it's limited because you have to register a month in advance. So the people who've registered will have access to the UN Datathon data, but it's a, uh, it's it's for the closed group. It's not for it's not completely open. That was one of the agreements we had to go through to get the data source, etc. So, um, yes, you will get an email to confirm your participation and your team name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but obviously, we would never share you anyone. <laughs> Our whole thing is data privacy, so we're definitely not sharing anyone's emails anywhere. Um, as previously, Python. What is the purpose of having alternative packages rather than the actual ones? Ah, great question by DSG came in. Um, so the cons so basically the question is, why do we have like, um, we call it like OP so, um, underscore and the name as opposed to the original packages themselves. So inside of anti-granular, instead of having data frames, they're kind of wrapped and they're called private data frames. And there's two steps. We restrict the operations which you can apply um, so as soon as the code comes up, we can analyze it and say yes or no, if that's safe or not. And then there's dynamic analysis checks as well. So as the code is running, things are being checked to make sure that it's being safe and a sensitive data is being leaked. Uh, they're obviously all following strict rules. Now, because of that, we also have this core object called a private data frame or private series. And that's basically a wrapped subset of um, the regular pandas data frames and pandas data series. Um, and that's one of the ways we know what could be applied to what. Now, obviously the base packages typically are applied to regular pandas objects as opposed to private data objects. And so we've also internally wrapped them and white listed all of the methods. So the interfaces should match exactly. The only difference here obviously is um, pandas doesn't use differential privacy. The other libraries are made for differential privacy. So because pandas doesn't, there's just a term called EPS, like epsilon, that you just set equal to whatever, but otherwise the interfaces should match exactly. Um, from a user perspective, but they're passing in private data frames as opposed to regular data frames. And just to prevent confusion, that's why the name is OP underscore. And then, um, yeah. oh, sorry, private Python, not basic Python. <laughs> the reason for that is because um, regular Python allows you to extract out sensitive information really, really easily. So like you could, if you had a data frame, you could obviously just do like an eye lock on it. So you, you could look up a record level information, just download it to your computer. Um, or you could have like a pointer and use the pointer for an index. So actually what's happening under the hood is it kind of creates a DAG, it's like a directed graph of, of sensitive data in, and it makes sure that that sensitive data has definitely passed through a differential privacy mechanism before you print it or export it. Uh, because of all of those limitations, you can't read and write file. You know, it's a restricted variant of Python. Um, and that's why we've been calling it private Python rather than just Python. So it's just to prevent confusion. Great question though. Um, I think you'll find it hopefully fairly easy to use. I mean, it's meant to be as intuitive and as regular to regular, sorry, as similar to regular data science with Python as can be with the restriction that it enforces the privacy. Yeah, great question. Great. Any other last minute questions? I can start to see um, if some people are. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I had a question. I think mm -hmm. I have asked this question before too. And today I actually asked uh, to the 
the main committee members. But I was curious about uh, the pet, the the track for this pet, uh, the competition, and the AWS. Like, how are these two integrating? Um, since um, it seems like you know because of this privacy uh clauses and all this that revolves around this. Uh, how is there a way to integrate? AWS services while we are, uh, you know, using the data sources perhaps from there. And so, so no, so, so basically in the data phone, a number of data sets are made available. Um, and there's different like platforms or tools you could use with different ones of them. Um, the data set that's in the private track is still semi private or confidential. Um, mm -hmm. And thus, you can't directly access it, which obviously you could if you were just playing around with AWS right. uh, tools. Um, however, maybe you can get some insights from the private data sets, and maybe you can use that with information that you've gotten through other platforms or whatnot. So the datathon itself doesn't really restrict what you do across the different platforms or how you can find that information. In fact, if you can think of a creative way that's useful to do so, like go for it. Like that would probably be quite a compelling um, uh, entry. I know the data sets which we are managing. <laughs> I'm not sure the data sets which they are managing yet. So I'm not sure how um, right. how related they would be, but if they are, like go for it for sure. Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. So you're saying like essentially the pet track, I was just curious because uh, to be considering pet track that needs to be in the submission that needs to be reflected. So if there is some portion of it not reflecting the privacy, uh, it, like, you know, measures that would still be considered as pet track just because we have used some of it, right? 100%. So right. yes, absolutely. Sorry, maybe that wasn't clear. So you don't have to say, hey, I'm only going to do pets. It's it's if you use the data set at all within the pets and you use any of the mechanisms and that contributes in any way towards your proposal, you're considered within the pet track. And there's a special prize for the within the pet track itself as well. So oh, yeah, cool. go for it. I mean, okay. yeah, and you get to learn about more things, right? You get to learn about privacy enhancing technologies, but also AWS and you know other tools. So yes, one hundred percent, go for it. Thank you, Jack. Actually, uh, interesting fun fact: the confidential computing trusted execution environments that are run in the back end of um, uh, Antigranular are AWS Nitro enclaves, and we work incredibly closely with the AWS team. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure they will be uh, more Actually, than Actually, that, that was partly the reason I was I was asking this question because I looked at Oblivious website and they were yeah. saying they were being powered by AWS, uh, AWS. So that's why I was kind of curious. But okay, A exactly. You. Total coincidence that they're also in the data thon. Uh, it just <laughs> so happened to be that way. Yeah. Awesome. There's Thanks. not that many cloud providers, I guess. Um, the dynamic pipeline, how restrictive does it do? Could I get some insights on the measurements? But... So, so another question came in. Um, so for the dynamic pipeline, how restrictive does it go, I guess? Could I get some insights on the measurement that, of that epsilon value? So you can, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question correctly. Um, so I might be answering it in, <laughs> incorrectly, so I apologize. Um, but essentially, you just choose what epsilons you want to use the whole way through. So any question you pose, a question could be getting a statistic. It could be um, training a machine learning model. It could be anything else. You just say how much epsilon you want to spend. And it will spend that amount and it will track your total epsilon spend. And once you hit the hard limit, I think it's 10, um, Ali can confirm that. But once you hit the hard limit, um, you can't ask any more questions. So that's basically how it works. The What I think you might be asking is how does it actually work under the hood? So um, it works in, in two ways. So there's like this static analysis check and dynamic analysis checks. And there's a ton of checks that happen um, under the hood within that to kind of make sure that globals aren't updated within methods that are applied to record level information, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of abstracted away from the user. So if you try to do something and it doesn't work, then the epsilon that you've tried to use doesn't get consumed and it just gives you an error. 
so it gives you that feedback loop. Um, with regards to the epsilon usage, you get to dictate how much epsilon you want to spend on each query. Um, we have essentially like an accountant at the background that just keeps track of what people did and how much epsilon they spent. Um, and so at the end, when you do your submissions, um, the judges will also see what your epsilon spend was. I mean, obviously you're encouraged to use less epsilon, but at the same time, you want to have a useful answer. That's why we put in a hard cap so nobody accidentally gets carried away and spends yeah, a ludicrous amount of epsilon. Um, yeah. Just one last thing. Uh, would we get an indicator if data we're using is in the path track? So would we get an indicator? So 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 there's different data sets on each of the platforms, I believe. Um, there definitely is in our case because we're the only ones holding this particular data set because it's sensitive. So we, we know that that's, uh, there's, there's some restrictions and limitations that we have to conform to. So it's definitely not provided on the other tracks. Um, so if you're using that data set, which will be made very clear in the wiki, you will necessarily be using the tools that I've mentioned today. And by using those tools, you'll necessarily be uh, kind of available to be able to, to, to win the prizes within the path track. I hope that's uh, clear. I just, I just really use the data set. That's Hi, Clarence. Clarence. Yeah, I just wanted to come in quickly just to follow up on this question. Um, so the, the data sets that are associated with the pet track, and Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, our partners, these are real data sets used by the FAO. And, um, you know, they're just pre-releasing it for us, right, before they ran all their anonymization on it. So these are real data sets, and there is actual private information in there. So this will only be, so these, like Jack said, these are tagged as only pet track only, right? Because they are actual real um, personal data sets. So if you're using them from this section, then they are definitely, that that's part of the pet track. Yep. Great. Thanks for that, Clarence as well. Great. Fantastic. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you everyone for joining. Um, have a great day. Thursday, I guess, depending on what part of the world you're in, it might already be Friday. Um, and best of luck in the datathon. I think I'm supporting Ali on another uh, one of these sessions next week, if I'm correct. Um, so hopefully I'll see many of you there. But otherwise, best of luck in the datathon. We definitely have your back. Ask questions anytime. We're here to support you. Um, and yeah, if there's any challenges, just let us know and we'll, we'll try to help, support, fix, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Congratulations on, on, on signing up and getting involved. And yeah, hopefully let's use um, set good United Nations data for, for, for public good.